Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again, and this time we're going to talk about the structures and functions of biological molecules. So we're going to really be tying in the underlying parts that go together and how they are arranged of various monomers and how that will ultimately impact the function of the various macromolecules in their specific locations. So let's start with explaining how a change in a subunit of a polymer may lead to a change in the structure and function of the macromolecule. One of the easiest ways of doing this could be to talk about how changing a single base in DNA could ultimately have a functionality difference in the protein that is produced through the protein synthesis process. So I'm actually going to jump and talk about what happens when you take your DNA and you've got your strand of DNA and that's going to undergo transcription and then that's going to undergo translation. And so what we can see is we have an original protein that is made when we translate the mRNA into making a protein. Now, a protein is composed of different amino acids, and those amino acids have different properties. Some of them are positively charged. Some are negatively charged. Some of them have just a polarity to them. Some of them are nonpolar, and then will fold away from a given aqueous environment. And that creates the tertiary and quaternary structures of proteins that ultimately gives them their function. If we were to change the code of DNA, that leads to a change in the mRNA. And then depending on what happens with that mRNA, you can see two different types of mutations or changes that will lead to two different types of proteins. In one instance, we're going to change one of the amino acids in a missense mutation and go from our original protein now to this other protein. Now, the changing of glycine to alanine means we're going to be swapping one amino acid for another. And while that may seem like a relatively insignificant change, that's ultimately going to have a profound impact on how this protein folds up. It could have an impact on how it forms secondary structures, including alpha helices and beta sheets. And more importantly, it's going to have that tertiary and quaternary structure impact. And so what you'll notice is that my missense mutation is radically different than my normal protein. Now, in some instances, this could be not a big deal. It may still have the open active site or functional area of that protein to do the job of that protein. But in many instances, when you make this change, now you're going to be changing large portions of this protein and it's not going to be able to do the job of the protein. So if this was an enzyme, for example, we may have lost the active site. A similar impact would happen if we see a nonsense mutation, where now what's happened is because of a mutation, we are going to see instead of the isoleucine, we're actually going to get a stop codon dropped in. Now, this stop codon means that we're going to completely stop making the protein. You'll see this much smaller polypeptide that folds up into a protein. I've now made a totally non-functioning protein. So if this protein is associated with a set phenotype, that phenotype is going to be lost in an individual that has this mutation. So these are ways by changing the subunits of a polymer, what the sequence of amino acids are, or in this case, the length of the amino acids, we're ultimately going to impact the function of the macromolecule. This is actually changing two different ways because when, by changing the DNA, we ultimately have a trickle-down effect on the protein. So this is changing one of our macromolecules, which ultimately changes a secondary one in the form of the protein. All right, so directionality of subcomponents is also a major issue, especially when it comes to the function of a polymer. And I think this is most notably when we talk about DNA and RNA. So one of the big things about nucleic acids is that they have directionality. So as you can see here, we have a 5' end and a 3' end, and DNA is always built in the 5' to 3' direction. The reason for that is that the 3' end has a exposed hydroxyl, and hydroxyls are often the sites of phosphorylation. And so both during DNA and RNA synthesis, nucleotides are always going to be added to that 3' end, targeting that free hydroxyl end to add in the phosphate of the new base that will be added in. Now, these are typically nucleoside triphosphates, which means that they've had ed added energy, and the loss of those two extra phosphates uh, facilitates the energetics of adding this new nucleotide on. But here we just have a simple monophosphate, and you can see that the phosphate is going to bind to this hydroxyl and add to that sugar phosphate backbone. The other key thing that we'll notice is that two DNA strands run anti-parallel, and this is another example that directionality influences the structure pretty dramatically. Now, this rolls over for us where the DNA structure is anti-parallel. This plays a role when we go through DNA replication. 
And what we end up seeing is that because DNA and RNA can only be built in that five prime to three prime direction, adding new nucleotides onto the three prime, we are going to, when we open up DNA and create a replication fork, we are going to be able to continuously add new nucleotides as we move towards those forks. But if we were going to do replication on the lagging strand, on that opposite strand, we're going to build little tiny Okazaki fragments as the DNA unzips and opens up the fork moving in a direction, we're going to slowly add fragments on going in that anti-parallel way. We will have enzymes that will come in later on and they will play a major role in fixing those specific breaks in the fragments by having the ligases bind together. When you're done and you see the two strands of DNA, you can't even tell the new strand from the old strand, let alone where it was continuously made versus discontinuously made. But the understanding of the process of DNA replication does involve understanding directionality. The other thing that we can talk about is that the structure of the anti-parallel helix has it such that when we look at them running opposite directions, that plays a role in how they form their hydrogen bonds, where the adenine and thymines make their two hydrogen bonds, and the cytosine and guanines make their three hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonding only works out when they run anti-parallel. All right. So bringing us back to our proteins, which we discussed earlier, proteins are these linear chains of amino acids that are connected by the formation of covalent bonds at the carboxyl terminus of the growing peptide. So just like we talked about a directionality comp component with adding new bases onto a nucleic acid, there are similar roles that play in the form of building a polypeptide. So directionality plays a major role in how you're going to be able to add on new amino acids onto your chain. So again, this plays a role when we look at protein synthesis that we're going to end up adding and building them, connecting the formation of covalent bonds at the C terminus end. So if we have this, we're going to be keep adding on in a set direction. And so that tells us the C terminus end is going to be the one that is going to be embedded within the ribosome where we're going to be adding new bases in that particular direction. And then lastly, when we talk about directionality of subcomponents, the proteins have that primary structure and the sequence of their order is going to have a constituent amino acid. The secondary structures is going to be how the backbones of those amino acids interact to form alpha, hel alpha helices or beta sheets, the tertiary structure is going to be when we make uh, either the disulfide bridges, maybe the acid-base interactions um, that would be between the subunits themselves, those R groups. And then when we bring those things together into the quaternary structure, we're going to be interacting multiple polypeptide units to form that quaternary structure. The chemistry involved with the folding has to do with the directionality of how those components run to one another, but also the chemistry of the interactions and the intermolecular forces that take place between the different subunits. So directionality of the subunits also will have an influence on polymers of carbohydrates. And so this has to do with how carbohydrates are put together and how enzymes can break them down. So for example, when we think about starch, glycogen, and cellulose, these are all three polymers of glucose put together into long chains. When we think of starch, starches are going to have these bridges and side chains, and they're all going to be composed using bonds that allow for amylase, the enzyme amylase, to come along and cleave those um, glycotic bridges. Glycogen, similarly, will be found in animal muscle cells that similarly is going to have very similar structures to starch, where it's going to be a polymer where the glycotic bridges can be cleaved using very simple enzymes, enzymes that are found within animals. Cellulose, however, has an alternating structure of how they form their bonds, and the enzymes that we find inside animals do not have the ability to cleave these alternating structures and the way this is composed. So the directionality of how those bonds form ultimately plays a role in how enzymes can get at them and break them down. This is why you can't take a handful of grass and chew it up and get energy from it, but you can take pasta that has a starch in it and you can gain energy from that. All right, so that hopefully gives you a good idea of how the subunits come together and how their directionality plays a key role in their functions. I hope this was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.